Okay. So yeah, we have the second talk this morning by Xuling Zheng. Okay, so um, go ahead. yeah, so the the talk title is combining ab initial calculation with uh, with the EFT for loosely bounded system, and this notation means um, you have leasing seven core uh, and the nu neutron in the initial state, and in the final state you have photon and the leasing eight compound. Um, for the second one, neutron I'm and lithium scattering going to gamma. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so then if you flip neutron to proton and proton to neutron, you get a second one. Uh, so, so, so nuclear physics is called is a, uh, uh, the ice cream mirror. What, of the what would be logic of this notation? Logica? Yeah, why, why not say lithium 7 plus n arrow? Yeah. Lithium oh, you can, you can. I mean, this is just convention. Well, there, is a there's a neutron beam and you detect the photon. I understand, but I <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. Um. So, so we um. These are the references for the two captures. Uh, the leucine seven capture is in this paper, and this one for the brain seven capture is being published right now. Um. So I will start with motivations to. Just to say why people are interested in these two reactions and why we don't we want to use this uh, ab initio plus EFT approach. So I will use a toy model to explain this idea. Um, so as I mentioned, you have a core, you have a nucleon. So in the toy model, I will forget about the the, uh, the spins of these uh, two particles. <coughs> then I will use I will talk about the two real uh, physical processes and. So for the leucine 7 capture, I need to add extra complexities due to the spins of uh, core and nucleon. And you have a low energy core excitation for the, uh, for the leucine 7. So I will show the leading order results. For the brain 7, uh, brain seven capture, the extra complexity is due to this uh, strong uh, coolant interaction between core and the proton. And I also show the leading order results. I, I will uh, close the talk with this uh, next leading order uh, discussion. So the motivations, the people are interested in these two reactions because uh, right now um, they are relevant to astrophysics. So uh, specifically, uh, it's uh, the brain 7 capture is relevant in the solar neutrino flux. It's, it's important to determine, determine some component in the solar neutrino flux. And because of that, uh, it's, it's important for the solar model building. And at the same time, it's also relevant for the neutrino mixing parameter uh, measurements because experiments, the neutrino oscillation experiments need to know the uh, solar neutrino flux uh, very well to improve these mixing parameters. So that's why people are interested in these two reactions. So let me just mention this solar neutrino generation uh, in the motivation. So. The left-hand side is the uh, PP chain solar, uh, the burning in the sun. <coughs> and there are different branches. And the interest, the, our interest is here for this reaction. So proton brain 7 goes to boron 8 photon. And, and after that, the boron 8 will decay and producing uh, electron neutrinos. And it has a very tiny branch ratio. It's like 0.1%. And you, you would ask, why, why is this? Uh, it's important. That's because uh, it dominates the high energy uh, part of the neutrino flux. So this diagram is the solar neutrino flux, and uh, y-axis is the flux versus x-axis the neutrino energy. So it's very small compared to these components. But at this region, uh, this one is uh, is very important. And it's right now it has a large uncertainty, 14 percent, according to this reference. And, and the, the reason is actually because uh, right now people cannot measure this cross-section uh, at, at these uh, stellar energies. So in the sun, the kinetic energy between these two is very small, 20 keV or so. Uh, right now, people can measure that in 0.1 MeV, so 100 keV. And the the cross-section is too small and so low. Yeah, yeah, because for 100 keV, to uh, 20 kV, the correlation is suppressed by many, many orders magnitude because it's a coolant 
barrier. So it's very, uh, it's a problem. So that's why people want to improve the uh, theoretic models uh, to either predict that or to make a connection between the high energy data and the low energy uh, cross-section. And that's what we want to do also. So that's for the uh, brilliant seven capture. For the leasing seven capture, um, there, there are some, there are some uh, literatures uh, claiming that it's relevant for the nuclear synthesis. And, and the other important uh, function, I mean, people use that also to constrain the models for the brain seven capture. Okay, so that's why we actually want to uh, study both. Um, so the motivation for, for our choice, I mean, for our approach can be summarized in these three different bullet, uh, these three bullets here. So as emphasized in previous EFT talks, this uh, approach provides a simple picture, systematic expansion on, uh, in terms of Lagrangian, so which provides the uncertainty estimate. And the particular idea of this work is we rely on the ab initial bound set information to, uh, to constrain or to fix the couplings in the EFT, and then use EFT to, uh, to calculate reactions. So you, you can think about this as some kind of ab initio reaction calculation. Okay, so that's, that's the motivations. So I will talk about toy model. The picture actually, the physics is quite simple. So initial, in the initial channel, you have a core and a nucleon, and, and they interact through S-wave and D-wave. I, I will explain why. And in the final state, you have a photon, and you have a very shallow bound state. So it's, it's a big bound state. So I will put it this way. Um, so um, because people know that for the leasing eight of the boron eight in the final state, that compound nucleus um, is a P wave bound state. So the, the, the dominant configuration is P wave. And this transition happens for the E1 transition. So you know the initial, uh, the initial state must have the positive parity. So, it's, uh, so that's why I call it dominant by uh, it's, it's S wave and D wave. Um, the other scenario is that a, this transition happens in a very short distance. So, um, so the reason I want to split them is because from EFT point of view, this one dominates over this one. So that's why, uh, so basically this is the uh, power counting of EFT. Um, because you have large, uh, large radius, or you have very large uh, uh, nucleus. So put things in a, in a mathematic, I mean, to, to put this in an abstract way, is that this amplitude will look like a, a matrix element sandwiched by this E1 transition operator. Uh, no, no, so E1 transition operator R sandwiched by initial and the final states. And, and you can split this matrix element to these uh, long range contributions, long distance contribution, and this comes from short distance contributions. And again, in, in the EFT calculation, a leading order, we are going to focus on this one. So that's what I mean, split the two scenarios. And there is a reason why you can split them. Um, so I wonder whether this reminds subatomic physics of uh, similar processes. You know, you have uh, some kind of transition between the, uh, the plane wave uh, uh, um, continuum state and this bounce, shallow bound states through some reactions. Um, so let me just mention some gross features of the system to motivate the toy model. Um, so this basically, this diagram is another way to, to, to explain the physics in the previous slides. So this is spectrum for listening seven. Ignore all these structures. Just pay attention to the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an active parity object and it takes about 2.5 MeV to break this guy apart to the uh, two nucleus. And the leasing eight nucleus in, uh, is the ground states. Uh, it has a parity plus positive ground states and it's bounded by roughly two MeV below leasing seven neutron threshold. So people has already, I mean, in my previous talk, people suggested I put here, align this one here because Basically, leasing seven sits on this line. 
but, um, but I would rather in this way because of the space I have in the slide. Um, so if you translate all these numbers, the two energy uh, uh, to the um, binding momentum, which correspond to the, uh, the length scale of this wave function for this thing eight, so the short energy scale, or uh, short momentum scale here, is a binding momentum between four and three, between these two guys, and this is roughly 100 MeV, and the binding energy of leasing eight in terms of uh, seven and one. So seven and one basically is seven nucleon uh, in the uh, in the leasing seven and the one nucleon, and here the four means the helium four, and the three means the triton. Okay, so this is the notation. So the binding momentum over the lambda is 0.5. So the idea is we try to uh, uh, we we treat this as a small parameter. So this means the starting point or EFT. Uh, okay. So we ex we expand around uh, zero binding energy. Okay. Oh. Uh, basically, okay, so leasing 7 has a structure, has a sub-structure. And this structure, the way you estimate that the energy scale of that structure, it basically, I was using this number to estimate. So it takes that amount of energy to break it apart. Okay, so this means it's bounded by that amount of energy, and the, the binding momentum is this one between the two. Oh, sorry, this one. So is it bound by 2 MeV because... Yeah, 2.4. Yes, 2.5 MeV. And the is bound by, by 2 MeV. Yeah, but, but keep in mind that the effective energy uh, is different for the two systems. So one is 1.7 and one, another one is 4.3. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, so, so the characteristic feature for P wave in our problem is it has a very shallow, it has, it has a shallow P wave bound state. For the S wave, um, I will come back to why we have two channels. But right now, I just want to point out uh, in one particular channel, we have a large negative scattering length. And that's what you want to uh, reproduce in your EFT. Um, so we can associate this number as a, a scale like one of gamma. So numerically, it agrees. And this is you want, what you want to take away from this slide. So you want but to do it's, it's a large S wave scattering length between what and what? Oh sorry, it's uh, between core and nucleon. So lysine seven and neutron. Or the or burning seven and proton. So I will try to define the scattering length for the proton uh, for this burning seven case. Um, so people have in the previous talk people have mentioned many times. The, the other one is the helium triton. Yeah, yeah. So 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 it's so the reason I mentioned this one is because I want to know uh, in the leasing eight nucleus, uh, I should about I should think about leasing seven as a small object, or I should think about leasing seven as a large object. So this tells me this number, this number is bigger than this, uh, this number is bigger than this number. So this means I can treat leasing seven as a small object compared to leasing eight. Nucleus, the size of the leasing eight. That's the leading order picture. Um, so you can reproduce the S wave in the EFT. People has talk. People have talked about this many times in previous talks. Basically, you um, introduce a S wave interaction, uh, contact interaction between core and nucleon, and by using proper power counting or proper estimates of the size of these couplings, uh, you will realize the, um, so by using this estimate, you will realize all these bubble diagrams have this sum up. If you think about neutron and leasing seven scattering in the S wave, and this reproduce this leading order T matrix uh, from EFT, the point you want to take away is just, uh, we, we need one parameter G here in the Lagrangian or effectively we need to uh, know the scattering length in the S wave. And that's the leading order information we need. For the P wave, you have similar effective range expansion for this object. So since uh, A1 takes uh, uh, length uh, cube uh, units, so I, I will call this 
as a scattering volume and a R1 effective range for the P wave. And as I, as I mentioned, we want to reproduce a shallow P wave bound state. Um, to look for the bound state, you want to see the pole of the T matrix, and, and you would expect this guy. So, so here, gamma is binding momentum. So correspondingly, you take K to the I gamma. And this guy has to go zero if you want to look for the pole. And one way to reproduce the shallow bound states is uh, you, you, you associate R1 as some high energy scale. And so this number basically is much bigger than this one. So you can forget about this uh, at leading order. And you tell, this tells you A1 has to go like this. So naively, because A1 is um, the length cube, so naively, you would say A1 goes like 1 over lambda cube. But it, turn, it turns out we have to make this guy unnaturally large. So that's why I said it's an unnatural case. And this is a reference. I think they, uh, they proposed this idea. Of, um, so you want to reproduce this in the EFT. People have mentioned also this many times. You introduce some auxiliary fields corresponding uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the bound states. Okay, so it's a P wave, so you have this I running from minus one to one, and again, the coupling is P wave, so you have this um, dimer field or the auxiliary field coupled to the velocity, relative velocity. You have two couplings in the EFT. This pi is not a pi, right? It's no, 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 it's a dimer, dimer field or auxiliary field corresponding to a P wave bound state. Plus, plus the neutron, plus yeah, neutron. yeah. Okay. Um, so with the proper power counting, you will see the propagator of this guy or this guy, um, which will be used in the T matrix calculation, has to be fully addressed, uh, fully dressed up. So this means you have some all orders of uh, of these bubble diagrams, and then you look. So this would be. So this will reproduce the. Uh, the 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 T matrix near the pole is actually you have keep this term. Um, the point I want to take away is you you have two parameters in the Lagrangian and effectively you need to know uh, uh, the the scattering volume and effective range in the P wave. And as I said, we know the place, I, we know the position of the pole because we know the binding momentum of this uh, core plus neutron bound states. So we need another. Uh, equation on another piece of Im information to fix these two couplings. So that's why, that's where this ab initio plus uh, EFT idea come from. So we will use this asymptotic normalizing coefficient. This also has been mentioned many times, but I, want, I, I will try to explain a little bit more in detail. So one way to think about that is if you look at the, the two-body propagator, so, so I'm, I'm talking about two-body right now, and the full pole uh, so so if you if you take energy to the pole, so basically the minus binding energy, um, the green function here will have a will, will have will be dominated by the pole. And if you put the full green uh, full bound state wave function here and here, you will see the residue basically is the is the bound state wave function complex conjugate times bound state wave function. And if you, if you take this R and R prime to go to large distance, this bound state wave function will uh, approach the asymptotic wave functions. And this is the asymptotic wave function for the P wave bound state. So it's at least here. And the coefficient is C squared. It basically, that's how you define A and C. Okay, so A and C is C here. On the other hand, this, this propagator, full propagator can be connected to the, to the EFT calculation, uh, T matrix calculation. So through this expansion, and this T matrix can be computed by using this diagram. And you can find out that uh, the relation between uh, ANC and the effective range and the binding momentum. And as I said, you know the position of the pole. So you have these two constraints. You can figure out the two parameters in your, c in your theory. OK, so that's what I'm. I mentioned you only need three parameters to do leading order capture calculation. OK, by the way, uh, the, we will use the ANCs from this ab initial calculation. So this, 
this, uh, this, these people have computed the wave function, say, leasing aid and the boron aid, um, by using this variation of Monte Carlo method. Do you have any scattering information? Well, you, you, you know the S wave information, the scattering lengths. Okay, but in the P wave, this P wave channel, you know a bound state, but you. Yeah, you don't. Do anything about scattering? Do you um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that. So you're going to take this from some, some yeah. physics model? Yeah. Uh, okay, if you call this as a model. But um, so this is, this they, com they compute this uh, wave function, the boron the boron aid or leasing aid wave functions, and then try to figure out the ANCs from their wave function. So we will use that ANCs as the input. So the ab initio is, is... Yeah, it's here. They compute the ANC. I'm sorry? <laughs> OK, so... OK, uh, so that, that's the main idea, so essentially. Um, so you can do the captures. Um, the physics is very clear. And the leading order, you need to have these diagrams. And this means you do, uh, this, this diagram means the, uh, the uh, nuclear on the core and interact and get the emit a photon right after uh, they come into the, uh, uh, how to say. So basically, this diagram doesn't have initial state effect. So they, there's no multiple scattering between the, the nuclear and the core. But if you have a larger scattering lengths, this means they interact very strongly, then you have to include this multiple scattering here for the S wave. That's why this bubble diagram actually is as leading order. Normally, you would say bubble diagram comes as next in order. But if you have a large scattering lengths, the, the, the bubble diagram is pushed to the leading order. What do the lines represent? Sorry. Um, so, so dashed line here is a core. Well, yeah, that's our, our convention. And this solid line is uh, nucleon. And this is the photon line. And are those photon vertices just obtained by putting covariant derivatives? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Derivatives? Yeah, basically it couples the currents the, 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 when, when these two guys move. Yeah. Yeah. Come from covariant derivatives. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we can figure out the parameters uh, for the P wave interaction. This is a P wave. And we, we can figure out, I mean, we know the scanning length for the S wave. And then you can compute the capture. So this amplitude for the capture uh, don't, don't, don't be carried away by this uh, expression. I just want to mention one thing here. Um, so without capital X, all those pieces come from the from the tree level diagram. So the loop contribution is encoded in this capital X. And it has some structure. And depend on, uh, and obviously, it depends on the scattering length in the S wave, because that's initial state scattering. And it depends on the, uh, the binding momentum. And the PC here is the relative momentum between the two. Okay, And you can immediately see that. Um, if you have a small, if you have, if you have a large scattering length, you have a small momentum here, small momentum here, and a small momentum here. So x goes to the order one. And if you have small scattering lengths, this is pushed to the next in order because now x goes to gamma of lambda, the small number. And again, there's there are three parameter, uh, there are three parameters you need to fix to do. So. Um, a, gamma, and this coupling H. But H in terms is related to C, A and C, and the binding energy, binding moment, and gamma. So basically, you just need to know scattering lengths, binding moment, uh, and A and Cs. So this is for the toy model. Um, so let's come to the physical reactions. Uh, for the least seven neutron, there, is, uh, there's, uh, there was a, a previous uh, EFT calculation. So there are two differences, and uh, right now I just want to point out uh, one. The first one, uh, th basically the goal of this calculation. So this one uh, fits the EFT calculation to the data. So what we are doing is try to get coupling fixed from bound state and do then do reactions. 
and I will come to the second one later on. Now let's let's add the spins and the coexcitation back to the problem. So as I mentioned, the lysine seven uh, is a negative parity negative, and it has spin three half. Okay, keep that in mind. It has a low energy excitation, which is spin one half, st still a negative parity states. And on the other hand, the leasing eight has a the bound state or the ground states. Uh, total spin is two, um, and it has the uh, first excited states. Okay, it's bound again. It's bounded by by around one MeV below neutral leasing threshold. It has total spin one. Okay, so keep keep spins in your mind, mm -hmm. and okay, yeah. So I, I want to say this this uh, low energy excitation. You have all these spins, so put things together. You you will find out in the initial state, in the initial state, uh, you can have total spin one and two because you have three half spin and one half nuclear spin. So you have total spin one and two. So and this S wave, then you have total Total angular moment J equals one and two. You have D wave. Uh, for the core excitations, you have total spin zero and the one because this guy is one half and nuclear one half. So that's why you have one and three here. And for the final bound state here, as I mentioned, the P wave, and you have total spin one and two and this total angular moment J equals two. Okay, so you have two components. For in terms of the core excitation, you have it only give you spin one. Uh, in w I mean, spin zero component cannot happen because of the uh, quantum number mm, doesn't add up. So you have only one component from core excitation. So what this means is that if you if this uh, if this energy is zero, the leasing eight. Uh, the configuration of leasing seven plus neutron can very easily fluctuate to leasing seven core excitation plus neutron. And for the for the for the one plus ground state, uh, the the one plus first excited states, you actually have four components again: total spin s equals one two, and zero one, and its uh, total angular moment j equals one. So what you want to keep in your mind that you have three components in two plus, four components in one plus. Uh, the energy scales, so because you have a core excitation, the situation is a little bit uh, more complicated. So you have binding moment uh, here for the first uh, for the for the leasing eight ground states, and if you measure that ground, uh, measure that binding energy relative to the core excitation, that's a little bit bigger. The difference between the two is measured by this one, 30 MeV. And the, bond, uh, the binding momentum of the first excited states, uh, 40 MeV, and this, this basically is this guy measured to relative to the core excitation. It's a bit bigger. So we treat all this number as smaller than this guy. Um, so for the S wave scattering length, as I mentioned, since you have spin, uh, you can have total spin S equals 2 and total spin S equals 1 in the S wave. And one channel has a large scattering length, uh, negative scattering length. One channel have a small scattering length. Okay, and as I as I mentioned, you can use ANCs and uh, binding momentum to to constrain or to fix the parameters in the P wave. And so so we can use that information to fix the the effective range in the P wave. And that's the number that we get, and it, uh, it agrees this kind of estimate. Okay, it goes with like lambda. So this is the measurements for the scattering lengths. Um, so you want to come again, you want to come up with EFT to describe that. It's 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 no more complicated than the first one, but basically you have you have uh, different channels. Um, because you have a two plus bound states, sorry, I should mention uh, in this calculation I will compute the capture to the two plus and I will also capture to the one plus. Okay. Um, so this is the bell binding energy uh, for the two plus states, and this is the binding energy for the one plus bind, um, bound states. And as I said, you have three three different components in the S wave, and you have three components in the P wave for the two plus, and you have four components uh, for the one plus. So 
So that's how you count the number of couplings. So the, the, the Lagrangian eventually boils down to just a few diagrams. For the S wave, again, as I mentioned, for SI equals 2, you have large scanning lengths. For SI equals 1, you have much smaller. So this one is much bigger than this one. The core excitation is smaller because people have measured the neutron leasing 7 scattering. And it has data for inelastic channel. It's much smaller than elastic cross-section. So we treat this as al also a small number. And for the P wave, you have two different channels. And, and I will argue that this elastic channel and inelastic channel are on the same magnitude, uh, order of magnitude. So this one is, is yeah, it's probably the same. So this means when you compute the, uh, the 2 plus bound state, or pro, uh, 2 plus propagator here, you need to include the contribution from the core excitation. This just complicates things a little bit. And you can compute ANCs. Uh, in terms of the, you can make connection between ANC and the couplings, binding momentum. This Z here, basically the function of couplings. So as I mentioned, you have three components for the two plus, so you need three ANCs plus one binding momentum, so four couplings in the P wave. Um, so these numbers are from the uh, Ken Knowles calculation from this reference I have mentioned before. Um, this core excitation hasn't been, uh, was not computed in this paper, so Ken Knowles, uh, our collaborator, compute this later on. And there's a measurement for these ANCs. There's no data for the core excitation ANC. And for Oh, um, you actually, this is the E1 transition. So eventually, we see it's basically the uh, uh, dipole operator. So this should be, we should agree. How do you know? That's what the operators are using also. Uh, what I mean is that if you, so say you generate a potential current, which is not observable, and you have a wave function, which is not observable, and you just put the two together to get a matrix. Oh, oh. The ANC should be independent of this, all these details. It's unabsorbable. Yeah. Basically, they should have the same asymptotics, the wave function. So in, either in my calculation or either in their calculation. They should have <coughs> the same asymptotics. OK, so for the. For the one plus, you have four components. You have four ANCs and and your one binding momentum. And th these are the measurements. Actually, they, they are quite different. These are, these are very close. And this is the ANC in terms of the coexitation. And again, you can do the radio captures. The complexity is due to these spins. OK, that's, that's it. And, and the coexitation is pushed to the next in order. Um, you can compute. Amplitude is very similar to what we have in toy model. And there is a CG coefficient to make sure the quantum numbers are right. And these structures are the same as before. And you can go ahead and calculate the cross section. And I would skip these details, just show the results. Uh, the, da the data from here, so, so this is cross section uh, plot in log plot here. So log 10 sigma and log 10 energy. And and there's a reason why I want to do that. Um, so the data are from here. And this red line would be our calculation using all the central values I mentioned for the scattering lengths for the ANC. Um, this band basically corresponds to the, uh, the uncertainty, the next leading, order, uh, the next leading on uncertainty uh, we, ha we have. So it's around 40%. So what, what band is between the, the two dotted? This one and this one, the green and blue. So, so basically, if I time the cross section by 1.4, it goes from here to here. 0.6, it goes here from here. So, so we estimate the next leading order will may change our cross section by 40% either way. And there's a way to do that.
Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, but uh, what I want to say is that in within this band, they, they agree. Yeah. So, so is it clear why your correction does not depend on the energy, so that you can just sort of take forty percent and? <coughs> oh yeah, forty percent is a conservative, conservative estimate across this energy, because this energy, um, up to here, it's a uh, YMEV, I think. So. So it would expect the uncertainty here is maximal, and that correspond to uh, around 30 percent. Yeah. Uh, two questions. What, what, what was the original uncertainty about this, uh, the value you mentioned? Uh, because, yeah. because you have a capital lambda I mentioned. It's uh, around 200 MeV. And you have a binding moment. Uh, the low energy scale is around, uh, I think it's 50 MeV. So, and when you're when you compute the cross section, it's two times of that because you have square. Yeah, so roughly. Is this some sort of threshold behavior? Well, it's not threshold, it's because you have a finite Q value. So, because, okay, so eventually the, the photon at a very low energy will take away the binding energy. So the phase space is the same, and the flux will change. I mean, the flux will decrease if you have low, goes from high energy to low energy. That's why. Cross section where it goes like one of velocity. Yeah. Um, so you can compute the ratios uh, between different channels. Um, so for the capture to two plus, as I mentioned, you have two different channels. These are the ratios. Um, for the yeah. Photon energy is a binary energy. That's yeah, it's a two MeV. So at a very low energy, basically the the kinetic energy between neutron and least seven can be ignored. So this curvature there on the lower side is what's what's more interesting. The fact that this curve side. Yeah, here here it's basically it's one of V. So the the interaction doesn't have a very strong energy dependence. No, it's not. It's not. And, and why does it turn over then? Oh, it's um, because in this uh, in this calculation, you have this energy dependence here. So you have energy dependence when this PC goes to large, goes to a relatively large number. So that's why you suggest that experiments should be taken. Um. Yeah, actually, there is a there is a indirect measurements. Uh, I mean, the, the, that, that was a, a, a uh, I think, a group at MSU, Michigan State, recently reanalyzed their data uh, for this coolant association. So it's an opposite reaction. So not right now, you have photon produced in the final state. What they do is that they have this coolant break up. So the, this uh, final state will be flipped to the initial state. And and they have measurements somewhere here, yeah. And it's actually somewhere below, below the trend of this data is somewhere here. But th this indirect measurement, people has has doubt about the connection between the measurement and our capture. So maybe you have to deal with this. Is there a simple reason why this energy scale is in KEV? Is that just experimental? But I imagine these markers are. Oh, because okay, so you have energy scales like YMEV, yeah. the binding energy on the, on the order of YMEV. So you can expect things will change at MEV region. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Well, three keV is still small compared to MEV. No, this is log plot. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you can you can see the ratios. Um, so because for this channel, you have small scattering length, so it's, mo it's not modified by initial state effect. And this is the, the ratio we get. And there's a experiment lower bound here. So as I mentioned, there was a calculation, EFT calculation. And because they have some, some assumption, um, and that leads to this uh, breaking of this lower bound. 
So you can compute the same ratio for the capital one plus. Uh, we have two different numbers because uh, the ab initial NC is different from the uh, measurement. So that's why we have two results based on two different inputs. And you can also calculate this ratio, basically uh, the total capture and the, the two plus capture over the total capture. This is our number, and this is the measurement. Okay. And the last digit is going to be uncertainty in the yeah. initial? Uh, no, uh, it's, let's see. Um, actually, both. Both. So the uncertainty mm -hmm. of the next in order effect and the uncertainty of the ANC uncertainty and the scaling length. Yeah. So it comes to burning seven proton capture. As I mentioned, on the nuclear level, it's an SSB mirror of the lithium 7 capture. But, but when you look at it from EFT or core plus proton, they are quite different between, because this coolant energy is, is, is very large compared to the binding energy. Um, so that was, I mean, that was a, uh, the capture to the S, I mean, that was a S wave study uh, with coolant effect. So you see this reference. And I think Lucas uh, reported this result in the last week. Um, so cooling effect, the w I think the way I want to approach this is first uh, define some uh, momenta, uh, the characteristic momenta associated with the coolant. This is the charge of the core and the charge of the nucleon. So because now for the proton, it's, it's one. And alpha is the fine, it's a QED fine coupling constant. MR is the effective mass. And this is the ratio, it's a, very, it's a famous ratio here. Basically, this ratio measures the coolant energy relative to uh, the ratio between coolant energy and the kinetic energy of two guys. If it's order one, this means the coolant effect is non perturbative And there's a well, I mean, there's a conventional approach to, to compute the, uh, the propagator or to study this case. What, what this essentially does is you expand the four green function, two body green functions, in terms of the, uh, the coolant wave functions rather than the plane wave functions. So here, you treat H0 plus Vc, which is a pure coolant Hamiltonian. You treat that as your leading order Ham Hamiltonian. Okay, what this does is essentially is, is, is you sum up all these la ladder diagrams. Um, and the physics is, for this, in, instead of using plane wave, you use these, uh, the Coulomb wave functions. And these wave functions has some uh, uh, non-trivial analytic structure. So it has some exponential suppression, gamma function, and the Coulomb functions. The thing I want to mention is that if you, if you look at the, the probability based on these wave function for two guys get, a, get, get together, it's suppressed by this uh, number, the exponentially suppressed. If the eta is big, okay? This means if you, if you stay at low energy, this one is suppressed. And if you look at the transition, so the incoming state and the outgoing state, you have another phase uh, coming out. That's what I want to mention. And there is a standard effective range expansion for this case. Um, yeah, I, I just, want, just want to mention the reference for this one, for this S wave. And similarly for the P wave, you also have similar uh, effective range expansion. And what you want to take away is, again, for the S wave, you have one parameter. For the P wave, you have two parameters in our problem. So back to the spectrum. So the burning seven is very similar to the leasing seven. It has a low energy excitation, three half, and uh, the excitation is one half. And the boron eight, uh, it's different now. The binding energy is much smaller than leasing eight because of Coulomb at the point one MeV. And it's first excited at one plus, it's in the continuum. So in this case, we only consider capture to the ground state, okay? And if you look at all the energy scales now, you have a new one, this coolant energy scale, a moment scale I defined, 24 MeV, the binding momentum 15, the, la the, 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 large, the high energy scale here basically corresponds to this 1.6 MeV, which breaks brain 7 to these two, these two nucleus. 
and and <coughs> you have binding momentum relative to the core excitation, 30 mV, and the difference between this one and this one, 20, 20, yeah, 30 mV. And S wave scattering lengths now are different because um, there, there are measurements uh, having large uncertainty, but overall, it's both of both of them are very large, the, which is different from leasing leasing seven case, and this is the effective range for the R zero. Um, so right now, I mean, this this right now is not relevant in in, in our in our discussion here. So again, we use ANCs and binding momentum to fix the information couplings in the P wave. This is the scattering volume and this is the effective range. And we compute that, these are the numbers. So this agrees with this kind of uh, power counting, the estimates. And again, the expansion parameter is this low energy scale over large energy scale, and this guy is on the order of one. Okay, so these are all the energy scales in the problem. And now back to the spins, as I mentioned, these are the same for the leasing, uh, as the same as the leasing seven. This is also the same. So you have three components, and we don't consider borinate first size states. So again, you can dress up the propagator of the P wave dimer, and this, this one, this dash region basically means you sum up all the coolant effect. Um, you can compute ANC. It's modified because you have this energy scale again, so it makes things a little bit complicated. And Z, again, is a function of coupling. So you have three NC, uh, three H couplings, because you have three components in your wave function, and one binding momentum, and binding energy. So this means you, you, you can have three NC and one binding momentum to fix all the couplings. And again, you can do the radio captures. The diagram are very similar to the least in seven case, except you have to include the coolant effect in all the, uh, yeah, in all the intermediate states. So you can compute cross-section. So this is called S-factor. It's another way to, uh, to show the cross-section. As I mentioned, uh, go from high energy to low energy, the cross-section is suppressed by this exponential. So you want, yeah, so basically you, time, you, you, you times the cross-section to here. Here would be proportional cross-section. You time this factor to make this S to be, uh, to be the uh, normal size. And it has contribution from two different channels, spin, total spin SI equals one and two. And as I mentioned, the, the initial state has S wave and D wave contribution. And S wave is modified by scattering lengths, and D wave doesn't, it's not, sorry. Um, so, so this S corresponds to the overlap of the wave functions. So you have a, you have a dipole uh, operator and you have this uh, final state bounce the wave functions for the coolant case. And this is the initial state. So this G0 and F0 are the um, pure coolant wave function with specific angular momentum. So 0 means L equals 0. Uh, here, 0 means L equals 0. And here, 2 means uh, L equals 2. So it's D wave. So to help you understand, if you turn off the coolant, basically the F function goes to uh, base of function, G goes to this uh, irregular, irregular base of function, and W goes to this outgoing wave function uh, at negative energy. Um, so so this, uh, this table collects all the information we, we are going to use. Um, this, these are the initial calculations for the ANCs, and this is the ANC for core excitation. And there is another uh, no Cauchy model calculation here. So th they, they actually output the ANCs and the scattering lengths. So these are the measurements, and these are the measurements for scattering lengths. So these two, these two are very different. So that's why I say right now you have large uncertainty for the S-wave scattering lengths. In, so if you put everything together, you, you, you can make a plot. Um, so, so the data, I mean, the, the reference for the data in, this, in, the, in, the, in the next slide, um, what I want to say is that somewhere in this green band is our calculation using all the central values. And the reason you have a green band here is because this scattering length has uncertainty. OK? 
Okay. Um, so you can see uh, below this 0.1 MeV without data, the, the impact of scattering length is very tiny. So this is what people agreed a um, long time ago. But then if you go, go above that, this S wave, uh, the scattering length has actually has uh, some significant impact on the energy behavior of this S factor. So what people wanted to do, uh, they want to use the shape, of the, the shape of this line from some models and rescale that with the data and then extrapolate to the low energy. So the solar energy is 20 kV, is somewhere here. And these are the data. Okay, so you, want, you need a curve to connect this data and this low energy. Um, so this would be the, the band due to the uh, scattering length. So this, so we actually, this is a major point in our uh, second paper is you need better uh, S-wave measurements to uh, to 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 have uh, to extrapolate data to zero energy. Can you just explain <coughs> the, the contents of that table again? I didn't oh, okay. So, uh, so these are the ANCs from Canola's calculation from these ab initio calculations. They don't have scanning links. They don't they don't compute. And uh, this is the local shear model calculation. So they output both. Okay, and this is a measurement. For the uh, for the ANC, and these are also measurements. What do you mean measurements? The experiment, the experimental measurements. What? The experimental measurements. But it's not observable. So what do you mean? Oh, they have they have um, yes. So they have they have some uh, connection. I mean, they use some kind of model to to uh, translate to trans translate this uh, transfer reaction information to the ANC. So the base. They actually measure the transfer reaction, some kind of, and use that to compute uh, to infer the ANC. Um, I mean, this is this goes back to Roxanne's question, right? I mean, it just seems that we have 100 percent variation in this uh, unobservable quantity. Uh, which 100 percent? Oh, you mean the scanning length, right? There, one is positive and the other two are negative. That's the sign convention about the A and C. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they but but just no, no. Sign, since what you measure is C absolute value squared, right? Well, it's not like there is the sign between. Uh, sorry, sorry. The sign between these and these yeah. are, are important, but the sign between these and the overall sign between these and these are, are irrelevant. That's convention. Sorry. Um, so when you said there were measurements on the A and C, is that what you meant, or did you mean their measurements for the scattering angles? Both, both. Yeah, the A and C measurements are not that are not direct measurements, so it's it's based on some assumption. Um, Oh yes, we actually can compute um, some some measurements. So these measurements again, I think this actually this measurement is done here. Um, so they they actually use the back. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's not in it's not in the range of our theory. No, we can't. Um, so this is one aspect of this plot. And, and since we have this uh, uncertainty for these ANCs, and the ANC over, I mean, the basically scales the overall S factor. So if you look at this, these are the ANCs. So it basically scales the overall S factor. And so, so that's why we have this kind of arrow bars, put the arrow bars here. So these arrow bars would be the uncertainty due to the ANC uncertainty, and this percentage-wise can be can be used across this energy region. Okay, so this is the the other the other source of the uncertainty because of the ANC. Oh, thank you. Um, What's the dotted line? So um, yeah, I haven't explained that. So you have this uh, another one uh, ab initial calculation. Okay. And this, this solid black line are their S-factor calculation. So it's ab initial calculation. 
It's a microscopic calculation. And this dash line are the results of our model by using their output. So, so the continuous line is another field calculation? This solid line is the microscopic calculation. So this kind. Okay. And this dash line are our calculation by so using their the output. Terms. By using their output. So if if the EFT is the exact, these two lines should agree. Yeah. What? I thought the green was your calculation. Oh, uh, the green is the calculation using these ANCs and the experimental measurements. The green, the green ones. Okay. Is these ANCs and these measurements. This dash line is, is using these numbers without any uncertainty because they don't show the uncertainty. Yeah, the, the scanning lengths are very different. So, so the, their calculation is uh, consistent? Well, no, no, so no. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so the assumption is that the, this calculation is exact, and then the difference between this line and this line would be the error of this leading order calculation. So Doesn't go right. So the difference between this line and this line is the EFT error. Well, why would you yeah, why would you give that as an estimate of the EFT error if I just drop random parameters into the EFT I could get a new M1? Getting what? If you take the EFT, which has yeah. the various parameters in it, yeah. and you just make those parameters anything you want, yeah. then you know, your your range of possible predictions is infinite. And here, I don't, I don't know why. Why is it infinite? I mean, this, this basically this band is what you mean. The central value from here, and the, uh, this, this, uh, this band is due to the, uh, the S-wave scanning okay, length. So you, you took your EFT, and yeah. you're using two different models to estimate the parameters, right? Two different models, yeah. OK. But only if you had some reason to believe that those two models were reasonable and encompassed your reasonable parameter error, would you then go back and say that's the error on our EFT? Well, the, the, the issue here is that the power gap, right? No. So, yes. Well, okay, so I, I'd suggest Well, the, the issue of <laughs> this one is two, two ab initial calculations actually have different uh, microscopic physics. I believe you. Yeah. That's the point. Well, I think we should come back to the meaning of this graph in the afternoon and just let if she two minutes to okay. articulate his conclusions. Okay, so, so, so people actually is planning to uh, improve this measurement for the S-wave at Triumph. Um, you can quantify the low energy behavior of the S-factor by fit that to this polynomial. And, and these are the results using different inputs. So the ab initial plus the experimental uh, scaling lengths, this would be the uh, correspond to the dash line. And this one is the experimental ANC and the experimental scaling lengths. Uh, there's uh, different numbers. I, I, wouldn't, I don't have time to explain now. But these the numbers are, from, are recommended from this review paper here. So the thing I want to point out is this number and this number agree within the, uh, the arrow. And then the arrow we have. So the summary is here. So, expect, uh, so it, the idea works at leading order. And the parameters you need the S wave scaling lengths, P wave ANC, and the binding momentum. And the P wave is a couple channel problem, which was ignored in previous calculation. And for the Berlin 7 capture, the point is uh, you need to improve the S wave measurements. And quickly go through the next in order. Oh. So just just one minute. So <laughs> so the coexitation is small, but it's, it happens at next in order. And and you need to improve your S wave scattering information. And you need to improve your P wave. And there is a short distance contribution. So this goes back to our my initial cartoon that you have a short distance contribution which is not in the leading order calculation. 
So you need to fix the couplings. There are different ways we, we plan to pursue. Uh, so you can extract that from direct ab initial calculations. So because you have wave functions, you can do some short, I mean, you can do some matrix element calculation. Or you can manipulate the bound states by changing the, the bounding con uh, boundary condition and the background field. You can, or you can use the data, the high energy data directly. But you have to come up with a smart way. So that's, that's it. Do I explain everything? No, but I should not expect to explain everything.